Good afternoon and welcome everyone to our webcast about data and cloud for smart factories. My name is Dominic Friedel. I am business development manager at NTT Global Data Centers and I have the pleasure to be your host and moderator today. Together with our partners Red Hat, Nutanix and Uberge, we would like to provide you some valuable insights about this topic from different perspectives in the next 60 minutes. And to start right away, let me give you a very brief overview of what we do at NTT Global Data Centers. So um, yeah, NTT is a Japanese telecommunications company and known as one of the leading ICT service providers worldwide. And our portfolio spreads from ICT infrastructure, such as submarine cables, co-location data centers, connectivity and cloud, um, over services like consulting, technical services, managed services and support, um, up to several expertise um, yeah, directions like, for example, intelligent business, intelligent workplace, intelligent infrastructure, as well as intelligent cybersecurity. And as I am personally part of the Global Data Centers Group, let me give you some insights about what we understand um, when we talk about global data centers. So we provide um, over 160 data centers worldwide in 20 different countries. We provide the space, the power, the cooling, the connectivity, as well as the security for your um, IT infrastructure. And we also provide the direct access to um, yeah, all the major public cloud providers, hyperscalers and internet exchanges. And with our technology experience lab, we um, have a great opportunity to give our um, customers um, yeah, different possibilities um, to, to explore and validate um, over 100 uh, different use cases uh, that we have built up um, with our partner ecosystem that consists of more than 150 different partners. And uh, to have an insight inside uh, the smart factory and industry 4.0 topic, um, I brought one uh, major statistic that shows that uh, the global market of industry uh, 4.0 is raising really tremendously. So as you see over the past uh, years, it is really growing continuously and it will still grow, for example, um, in 2023 we will have a global market size of over 310 billion uh, US dollars. And there are basically um, yeah, three main points that I want to show. And that is first that the developments of new data-driven business models are still in an early stage. The second point is that the manufacturing industry focuses currently only on the digitalization of products and not on the digitalization of um, services or business models. And the third point is that the disruptive potential of business model innovation is still um, really underestimated. So there is a lot of potential and a huge gap still in digitalization for business models in the manufacturing industry. And so let's have a look on data-driven use cases uh, that can be applied. So for example, um, predictive maintenance is possible, or for example, also um, process automation, as well as new business or service models that can be applied or uh, additive or customized production. And all of these use cases are really relying on uh, data. So data is the core asset. And so we have different technologies that is using this data um, for further use. So for example, uh, when we talk about IoT, so in this uh, Internet of Things, um, we connect machines, devices, and sensors to, let, to collect the data. Um, then we have cloud technology to store and access data in one uh, platform in the best case. Then we have um, analytics, so also big data uh, to aggregate data, uh, to identify patterns and logical measures. And at the end, we also can talk about blockchain to create an immutable lock uh, to make data really trustworthy. And we will hear about this um, technology more later on. So what is our stake as a data center provider in this topic? 
um, we see the journey from data from edge to cloud and we see the data center as a foundation for data driven business. So um, if you, for example, collect um, data from sensors, from uh, production plants, from factory, factory floor, from field machines or other devices, all this data needs to be collected and transferred, for example, um, via IoT gateways into the core. And we see the core as the uh, data center, or in our case, the co-location data center. And we see about uh, three petabytes of data per connected factory per day. And in the data center, you can then apply different technologies like, for example, big data analytics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, the transfer also to the public cloud or a lot of other um, yeah, technologies that can be applied uh, to, to get the most of, out of your data. And uh, that's it from my side already. Um, I want to introduce you to the today's speakers. Um, we have on the one hand side, um, Wolfram Richter from Red Hat to talk about the open platform for smart factories. We also have Winfried Machotta uh, from Nutanix to talk about data from edge to cloud. And we also have Dominic Lenacik from Uberge to talk about trusted data and smart factories. That's it from my side. I hope you can enjoy the talks. You will learn uh, and get new insights. And we will also uh, record the session. So you will be able to um, get an insight afterwards as well as um, we will send around a follow-up email so that you can get um, yeah, the download of all the slides of our speakers. So that's it. Um, and over to the first speaker. So I will be taking over. Let me see if I can make that somewhat smoothly. Um, I should be presenting now. Yes. Okay, great. So uh, my name is Wolfram Richter. I'm chief architect for manufacturing. Um, built this presentation together with my colleague Harold who looks after automotive customers. And we're both uh, working for Red Hat. I've been with Red Hat for six years and it may not be that all of you know what actually Red Hat is and does and probably know us as the Linux company, but as a matter of fact, Red Hat has been expanding into multiple different areas in addition to our core platform, which is Linux. We started very early in, in 2006 already by acquiring a small company called JBoss, which had an open source product called JBoss, which brought us into the middleware space. And from there, we've been expanding into multiple different middleware areas, but also in, in automation. and the key thing that Red Hat does is actually making open source software work for the enterprise. So basically, um, whatever is perceived as risk or issues with open source technology, we make that worthwhile for the enterprise so that our, comp uh, our customers are able to consume basically open source innovation, but have the backing of a major vendor behind it. So in case anything goes wrong, we're there to help and we're there to help you prevent actually going from anything going wrong. That being said, what is our play in, in smart factories? Now, what we see, of course, Red Hat has been very strong in the past in uh, the cloud and in the corporate headquarters and the corporate data centers. And of course, um, if you see a, a standard hierarchy within a manufacturing customer, you usually have central headquarters, you might have, sorry, regional, data centers um, that run in the countries. Then you have the actual production plants that are built to be independent of any uh, centralized function um, where you have something which is still called a data center, which, which might in fact just be a dedicated room where IT equipment is stored. And then you have the actual production lines. You have um, something um, that is close to the production line, like that controls the production line. And then you have the sensors, actuators, PLCs, et cetera, that, that control the production process. And going from right to left, um, the order of magnitude, of course, increases right from single headquarters to multiple regional data centers to many different plants to many potentially thousands of production lines to a huge number of sensors and actuators. But you also have not only a change in quantity, but also a change in how those things actually work. So for example, once we go towards the actual production line, we're suddenly now talking about 
technology which needs to be safety critical, reliable. We're talking about field buses. So that stuff doesn't really um, come naturally to a IT company like Red Hat. And this is but what we've seen recently, the demand has been grown into because we've enabled our customers in the central data center to easily build and deploy new applications to have everything available API driven and on demand. And suddenly we see the same kinds of demands of being able to deploy applications easily to make use of new and modern API driven approaches and automation approaches to also be available close to the production line so that you can actually implement those use cases easily and bring them and update them very frequently close to the production line. So all the use cases that Dominic talked about, predictive analytics, quality assurance, et cetera, et cetera, those are enabled by software and those need to be deployed in the production areas because in certain scenarios, you don't want to transfer all the data out or you cannot even transfer all the data out. And in other cases, you need a very low latency connection to the devices that you actually might be controlling in order to fulfill some process requirements. So there are multiple reasons why the actual interest is of moving the ability to bring software close to the uh, production line. Um, and, and we've been in these discussions with multiple different customers who have decided for our technology stack in the data center and are looking at applying that uh, in, in their factories as well. So some of the typical questions we're being asked is, for example, how can I achieve real-time transparency into what is actually happening in the data center? So it's comparably easy for a plant operator or plant supervisor to look into his, his HMI system uh, and, and see what's going on. But once you're a bit detached from that, once you're, for example, in a planning function, uh, in the in the corporate data center, um, you no longer have that level of visibility. How do I optimize the role of configuration across hundreds of manufacturing plants, right? I need to somehow streamline that. I cannot, can no longer burn a CD or take a USB stick and, and just move to each production line, plug that in somewhere and do that automatically. But you need a way to reliably roll out both the code and the configuration across a wide array of manufacturing plants that are out there. How do I benefit from artificial intelligence and machine learning to improve quality, right? This was, was mentioned before. This, this means two things. First of all is how do I actually gather the data and collect it in the sensors and the instrumentation that is out there and bring it into a, a pool, a data lake where you can then run machine learning models on. But at the same time, those models need to actually move back from wherever the data scientist resides that actually does uh, the analysis work towards the um, production line where then a, a, a model execution takes place. How do I leverage big data technology for traceability and analytics on the shop floor? How do I speed up software development and release cycles for manufacturing operation management systems? So all of these questions are, are something that our customers concern themselves with. And we sort of synthesized an open source approach to those problems. And I'm now looking into the transmitted video pictures of my fellow speakers because they're now getting really scared that I will take the next 30 minutes explaining the slide, which I promise you I will not do, right? Um, this is a bit of a complex where we sort of put together our view on how can actually a stack of open source technologies help you achieving this problem. So basically, just on a very high level, you have the corporate headquarter on the right-hand side. You have the actual plant operation, the factory on the left-hand side. And then you have sort of the need to move the brilliant things that the developers do from the right to left. And you somehow need to take the data that is generated on the left-hand side, the sensors, the actuators that are out there, et cetera, and aggregate that and move that somehow from, from right to left. And one of the key difficulties here is, for example, that due to historic reasons, the actual plant operations are firewalled off, right? So they're, they're, they need to be protected. They very often run uh, outdated uh, IT systems within them. So you cannot say, okay, everything's internet connected, just go crazy with it. But you need somehow an intelligent way of actually controlling something that is firewalled off. The way that we suggest to do it is to take a GitOps based approach where basically 
all the code and config changes are transported on a pull level so, so that something that is low privileged can actually pull configuration into it but we're still managing to expose sensor data and also um, metrics and monitoring data from the actual systems that are running out in the field um, to, to the back end. Now, as you can see, these are all open source technologies, some of which I would even claim most of which Red Hat provides some support for, but there's still in our vision some parts that are still basically um, um, plain open source technologies. Um, and and uh, of course, every um, solutions that is built on such a stack needs to be vetted and, and integrated into whatever is out there in the field. Now that sounds like a ton of boring uh, theory. So what we did is we built a demo implementation of this approach um, that was built for our Red Hat Summit, our virtual event that was uh, held in, in April. And so we discussed about how well, how can we do coding simulation and deployment to production? We said, okay, well, one of the key elements of this solution will be taking container technologies that are able to embed um, everything that makes up an application into a single transportable deployable unit and use that to do continuous integration and to continuous delivery from the data center to the edge. We want to do a declarative configuration management. So we want to have something that is repeatable and where the end-to-end -end system actually converges towards a known state. So we're using GitOps approaches. In this example, we, we were using Argo CD to ensure that basically we can only declare our intent, what the configuration would look like in a central Git repository. Git is well known to IT folks. And by that, we get basically something like a uh, audit log, who did which change, a replication mechanism across uh, 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 environments, et cetera, for free as well. And we're using an intelligent uh, uh, approach to actually um, apply these changes that are then located in the Git to the running environments. Um, we were looking at how to actually process uh, data from sensors to the analytics. So we're using a stack of open source middleware tools and an open source AI ML stack to gather the data, to cleanse it, to then uh, create a, a, a predictive model and feed that back uh, into the, the process. And we were doing uh, machine learning model training and deployment to production through our open data hub, which is basically a opinionated approach to combine best of breed open source projects around Jupyter Hub, Spark, and, and others um, that is enabled through continuous integration, continuous delivery. So if you're interested in that demo, it's available for replay in two different levels. I mean, it had been part of Red Hat's general session. So if you register and the Red Hat Summit side, you can access all the sessions from this year. Um, in the general session four, there is one slot where you see the NVIDIA logo where that demo is, is shown in, in a couple of minutes. And then you have a deeper dive on the GitOps approaches in the R&D edge environment. So this is what we did to prove that this approach is actually viable. Um, we're also looking at industry collaborations. So there is, or there has been for a while, the Eclipse IoT project that looks more in the middleware connectivity space where Red Hat is a steering member. And we've just joined the open manufacturing platform, which looks at how uh, manufacturers and, and uh, uh, providers can work together to create open platforms for manufacturing in a vendor neutral approach. So that being said, factory edge is a strategic topic for Red Hat. Um, we believe that our technologies and a solution are a perfect fit for the factory edge. And we also believe that open source is a key enabler for the industrial internet of things, not only because it brings great technology, that's basically a necessity, but it isn't enough. It's also a great way to collaborate without getting into problems of antitrust, without uh, having to, to agree on special terms. We can do that in the open and that works really well together. And this means the whole ecosystem is important for us. So of course, we're interested to work together. If, if you're interested in learning more about this, or if you're interested in hearing in more details what we're doing here, what our thinking is, what our approaches are, please contact us. Our contacts are on the first page of this presentation. With that, I want to 
open the stage for one or two minutes of, of questions, if there are any. I have to admit, I didn't follow the chat. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. That was uh, really interesting. Uh, so what I forgot to mention at the beginning, um, the audience is totally capable of uh, writing questions in the chat. So if you're, um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to, to ask them and I can bring them up to the speakers. Um, because by now there are no questions. That's good. So you answered everything. <laughs> <laughs> are there answers in them or I, I uh, sort of shocked and awed them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't hope so, but um, otherwise, uh, you, I think you will be around, right? So you will be able to, to answer all the questions directly in the chat. Exactly. So if there's questions, please put them to the chat. If we have uh, an additional couple of minutes in the end, I'll be happy to stay around until the end. And then we have the potential to discuss. And then I would be handing over to the next speaker. Perfect. All right. Thanks a lot. Then I think we can hand over to the next one. So Winfried, that's your Oops. stage. Perfect. Uh, we can see your yeah. screen. Okay. So, uh, oh, wow. That's, that was, that was really, really good. And, and I understood now that uh, Nutanix has also some overlap with Red Hat. So that's really great. Great to learn and great to understand. It's always good to have this, this webinars together. And um, so, um, Dominic, thanks for the invite. Thank you for giving us a chance to show what probably a lot of customers don't know about Nutanix. Um, so the topic was data from, from edge to cloud. And I added this question mark because is it not the other way around? What do we currently see in the field? So uh, is edge the new robo? I was on a conference and, uh, and somebody approached to me and said, hey, we centralized everything in the 90s. So now you tell me that everything is going back to the edge. So does it, does it mean data center centralization is gone? Is edge the new robo? So I think uh, this is maybe what we have to do uh, and have to talk. So my business card is, uh, is under the, the QTAC, so you can download it. And I would like to extend the story a little bit to in combination, in context with digital transformation. So in Nutanix, as the founder of uh, hyperconverged infra infrastructure, this was just the homework, what we did to create a foundation. And based on this foundation, we give our customers the chance to address multi-cloud environments, to do the CI, CD, DevOps story, and of course, IoT, what is the focus on this presentation for today. So uh, i like to give you a quick update on digital transformation. Some things got covered by Dominic already, so I can maybe catch up some time there. And uh, then I give you a brief overview on our portfolio, something like an advertising block. And, uh, and then I give you an, uh, an insight of Xi IoT. It can be only in in 12 minutes in abstract. So from this point of view, if you like to get more information, get in touch with us, um, we are happy to help. So the journey to industry 4.0 is, is, is really a journey. So it starts at 1.0 when hydropower and steam drove, drove, drove everything. In 2.0, assembly lines were definitely what brought the industry up in 3.0, it was the first time we asked computer to help us, to assist us. And um, so the Germans are really, uh, it is always a discussion with, uh, with US guys. But to be honest, it was, it was Konrad, Konrad Suse with Z1 to Z3 and everything what he did. This is what started then. And now we talk about 4.0. And 4.0 is not a new standard whatever. It is the acronym for the digital age or for the digital revolution what we have. And most of us see advantages already themselves because it is now possible to get for an affordable price 3D prints or laser, laser carving. Everything what was nearly thinking impossible years ago are now um, not only able to get, 
also at a reasonable price. It's amazing. And when I talked to my colleagues, um, they said, okay, industry 4.0, it is only for manufacturing and industry. But we are on finance, we are on insurances, we are on healthcare. And to be honest, everybody has the same story. It is just the informatization. It is in architecture, it is BIM, building information modeling. For pharmaceutical, it is pharma 4.0, healthcare 4.0, finance 4.0. Everybody has his own transformation. And therefore, I would see this as a context to bring it together. And, and I think usually when I talk to customers, I give them two questions. Do we talk about OT versus IT? Or is it OT plus IT? And is it DevOps or is it Dev plus Ops? And when you ask these two questions, you immediately see where the customer is usually in the process. And today, I think it is, there's no doubt that we talk about OT plus IT, plus IT. So what is, what is in operational technology? What is in the manufacturing process? And how comes OT plus IT together? Because ages ago, it was just a valve or, um, or, um, or something like a device. And today, in these days, we have always smart devices, always sensors, always a Bluetooth stack, uh, a network socket on it, whatever. So, so therefore, there are a lot, of, a lot of challenges. And so when I'm going back, and I think in, the, in, the, in 2006 or something around, everybody started with this big data stuff. So customers talked about Hadoop, we have, we built up our own data lake. We have a Hadoop project, but the data has to remain on premise because this is our value, our intellectual property. It has to stay inside the company. And then years later, we start this data collection. It is the age of IoT, industrial IoT versus, versus consumer IoT. And then now, no surprise, a lot of customers has a data lake, which is more the development of what the Hadoop project was. And no surprise, the data lake is now cloud-based. They put the data lake in the cloud because they understand it is proprietary data. Nobody really can use it if you don't understand the interpretation to this data. It is machine data. So you need to understand where the data is coming from and Customers like to do this data mining from various um, um, sources. And developers like it because they use function as a, as a service. They use well-trained algorithms, cloud-based functions and algorithms. And it makes no sense to do the computation on premise, no, in the cloud, and to have the data on premise. You have the network latency and all the stuff. So therefore, no wonder, no surprise, everything is cloud-based. But what now, what else? What is now the next step we see? And the next step, and when you talk to customers and when you ask yourself about the value chain, you did all this stuff, but did you really generate value for your company doing it? And when you ask this question, sometimes people said, okay, it is not really easy to understand, to give you a proper number for this value, but we have to do it. And when it comes to this point, I think this is exactly where edge computing gets important. Because I see edge computing really important when you have to do local decision-making. And there are various examples. I think the easiest one is autonomous driving. So if you see the car as an edge device and the connection to the edge is gone, like your Alexa connection, like your Siri connection, Alexa and Siri is stupid. And in a, as an example for autonomous driving, all cars will stop or because they cannot even recognize traffic signs. So from this point of view, there is a need for local decision making. And this is what I, what I will try to give you a little bit more. And now I mentioned the, 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 the commercial, the advertising block. So you probably know that Nutanix uh, is the founder of hyper-converged infra infrastructure. We started 10 years ago. So um, 
our, our goal is to modernize your IT, you make your IT ready for this digital age. And then you have the possibility to, to build up your, your, your enterprise cloud. And your enterprise cloud is technology wise, the same web scale technology, what you usually know from Amazon, from Azure, from Google. And based on this technology, we offer you multiple services to have a, a multi-cloud moderation, orchestration um, subset of functions. And this is what our uh, product offering is about. We started with Core, which is this hyper-converged infrastructure. Then we give you now um, products for file service, for network security, object store, block storage. We have cloud-based functionality like desktop as a service. And, uh, but today, it is really important to talk about this Xi IoT product. It is called IoT, but you will quickly see it is more likely edge device management. And, um, and therefore, I got this overlap. We also like to work with open source in Nutanix. We started with our own hypervisor, KVM-based hypervisor. Everybody likes to work with, no, everybody on Linux side knows about KVM, but a lot of people said, oh, KVM is great, but to deal with KVM manually, that's not really easy. So I like to have everything a little bit more, more in a GUI and so on. And this is what Nutanix is doing a lot. Also, also um, on, our, um, on our IoT solution, we are using open source tools like Kafka and all this stuff. So, but we, we shape it into a usable way, way into easy point of, point, of, point of management and bring everything into one GUI, into one central point of administration. We heard from Dominic at the beginning, and I made a note that a digital factory uh, produce three petabyte of data a day. So that's exactly where I see the emergence and the urgency of doing something at the edge. And what we are usually doing, we use the magic mirror. When you visit our shows or when you are going to exhibitions and see our booth, um, sometimes you see the digital mirror and people going by doing some mimics and because everybody likes to see themselves in the mirror. So this is not a game. What we use it for, there are two TensorFlow algorithms running on it. So one algorithm is doing object recognition. So it understands that there is maybe a dining table or there is a person. Sometimes it shows a backpack or, or a trolley. So there are a lot of pieces this algorithm can, can, um, can, can recognize. And in case it finds a person, it tries to understand the person's mood. So a second TensorFlow algorithm runs and realize that this person is happy. In this example, it is always Nutanix employees, they are always happy. But usually we feel, we, see, we also see people who sometimes are sad or angry or whatever. So it is, but the reason we are doing it is, it is just one single HD cam. And a company has usually multi of these, tens, hundreds of these camps. And to get this information out, because we are not interested in trolleys, in desktops, we are interested how many happy persons move by and visit us. So only the number is for us interesting. And you see, for one single cam, it was over the day, so it was not after the full day, it was around 2 p.m. So 412 gigabyte of data got produced by one stupid logical HD webcam. And in total, there were 8, 78,000 inferences, so object recognitions. And in this special picture, there are three faces and the daily count goes up to 8,910 happy faces. If you cannot do it on the edge, you need to transfer the data stream to the cloud, do touch every single picture, make this TensorFlow calculation and recognition on every single picture 
drops this picture just to get the number 8,910. So do we really believe this is the way to go? Do we really believe 5G network will help and solve everything? We don't. So from this point of view, we see that the old traditional way to do sensor data ingestion through an IoT gateway, put everything into the cloud with real-time processing is possible, but it is not always possible. And there are better ways to do it. And from our perspective, the edge and the intelligent edge is definitely important. So that we can do some modification or some exams on the data stream going from the sensor, going from the sensor through the edge to the cloud. So the long-term training is from our point of view still in the cloud, but we can do locally some AI and, uh, and calculation stuff. And this is exactly what Nutanix Intelligent Edge is about. We talk to existing clouds at the back end, so to our own Zydata cloud, but we support also AWS, Azure, Google. We support private, private clouds. And then on the edge device, we have specialized edge hardware, so customers can use um, industry-based um, based, uh, computers. So right now on the, on the edge side, we support virtual machines and hardware, and the hardware, we have no certification list. The only uh, limits is currently Intel-based CPU, because we believe that we need the compute power and the Intel CPU will give us at the, at, at the edge. And we say, if, if a Red Hat or a CentOS, an open source Linux image running on it, then it will, it will work with Xi IoT, because we cannot certify all these various flavors of hardware in the market. And therefore, we believe we can reduce it to it and the PUC will find out if the hardware is supported. And then the edge device lifecycle management takes this task from you. You can do centralized provisioning, configuration, scale at the edge, upgrade, device upgrades, driver updates and all this stuff and monitoring, of course. And um, and this is about what we are doing. So the Xi, the Xi Intelligent Edge has, um, has uh, an operating system image. So when a customer is installing it, he will get, um, he will get a code, uh, a QTAC from us. He used this QTAC to generate a, um, a security token. And from this on, the Edge device is part of our management interface. There's no local, local lock on and everything. So it is, it is only create, um, the communication is only from the, from the management interface to the edge. And, uh, and then we push the image to it, install it and start it. So everything is centralized. And then you have definitely the, the data stream from the sensors to the cloud. And then you have some local NoSQL based database, algorithms, um, developers can push functions from the center to the edges. They can push containers on it. So you can run your own container. You can program your own functions. It is a platform as a service. So we give developers a platform to use it and to extend the cloud-based IoT to the edges. And um, so it's role-based access, access control. So you have different, different roles. A developer don't like to see the hardware. He's only interested in which functions, which containers are in, in which edges, on which edges currently running, what is necessary to update. And an infrastructure manager likes to understand which IoT device is behind and so on. So we have different role-based access controls on this. And um, this is just, and then I'm done. Uh, it is um, um, Amazon Go for restaurants, a reference site we have in France. It is a full automated cantina service. The guy comes into a, into a cantina. He pulls food out of the, out of the, uh, the shelves, put everything on his tray, moves to the register. And on the register, there is an automatic camera system taking it, scanning it, and doing, doing the checkout. So this is what partners are doing with this solution. We have also some references for digital manufacturing, control quality, control with cameras, devices, and so on. 
So that's what we are doing here. This is, this is more likely for manufacturing. And I hope I ran not too much out of time. Um, thanks a lot for your attention. All right, thanks a lot. That was really interesting. Um, luckily, there are no questions in the chat, so we can directly move over. Is the chat uh, working? Is the chat working? So, or maybe we can so have also. a round table at the end, Dominic. Yeah, we can also have. So let's see how much time we have at the end, and then we can have the round table. But I think it's working. So someone already wrote something. All right, over to you, Dominic. Yeah, thank you. Am I audible? Yes. Awesome. So hi, everyone. I'm Dominic from Uberge. Uh, Uberge is a Germany based uh, in German based startup. Uh, we have a blockchain based solution which focuses on the authenticity and integrity of IoT data or data coming from tiny devices or even bigger devices. Actually, that doesn't care. So uh, why is it? Okay. So um, actually my, my intro fits perfectly to what Winfried already said and also what Dominic showed us before. So what we see is that we are like currently, we are like in a second phase of digitalization, how we always call it, right? So the first phase, things we digitized vanished in the physical world, right? So we don't have any maps anymore. We don't write any ledgers. We don't have any forms. But in the second phase, it's about digitizing all those physical things. So it's about creating digital twins or some kinds of a digital representation, which gives us so many opportunities, all those opportunities we already know from the first phase of digitalization, right? So there will be new business models, there will be uh, new service models, there will be, there are so many possibilities with all those data coming from all those devices and connected things and smart things out there. So we truly believe that it's even more true than ever that it's data that drives the future of economy. And since we are now talking about uh, connecting millions and billions of machines and sensors around the world, the amount of data and the potential of it is of course huge and, and immense. And we have an example which we can refer to, which is the first wave of digitalization. So, but there's an issue with that. And the problem is that there is something that we call the trust gap or some articles also refer to it as like the air gap, literally speaking. It's, it's the, the, the connection between the physical object and the digital layer. So it's the connection between the physical object and the cloud. So how do we make sure that data that travels through the air really is trustworthy? And this gap exists because of many, many different reasons. So the main reason is that all the IoT or IT security mechanisms we have nowadays they were never built for millions of sensors, right? They were built for end-to-end -end connections between a handful of servers standing somewhere in data centers, uh, but not for a tiny devising hanging tree somewhere in the jungle. So all of that is, is hard to maintain if you really want to scale it. That makes it really, really hard to scale. It's very complex. And most of them focus on securing the data transmission channel. So this basically leads us to the conclusion that there, there is an issue with the trust in IoT data, especially if you want to use it in data-driven business models. Um, and uh, actually, you know, when you ask people why is IoT not growing, the answer is always it's, it's security concerns. And it's also concerns about the trustworthiness of data coming from those tiny devices or even bigger devices like machines standing somewhere in China. But the problem even goes beyond the, the air gap. So there, the trust gap actually remains even after we, we took care of the air gap because you know hacking also gets, gets new facades, right? It's not always about data breach or any data leakages. Uh, data manipulation has become very attractive. And if you think about of IoT data, if you change a signal to open the gate, to close the gate or the other way around, it's the manipulation which is the risk, or if you think about predictive maintenance and any kind of thresholds, right? So what if a hacker gets access to your data, multiplies your values, and suddenly your whole fleet rolls out to does the predictive maintenance in a fully automated way. So also sabotaging data gets more and more risk out there, and we have to take care of that, especially when to when when, when sorry, <laughs> when we want to drive uh, new data driven business models. This uh, actually fits perfectly to what, what Winfried uh, introduced. So, um, so trust is mandatory for the evolution of IoT, right? So this is our 
like very simple scheme of dividing the maturity or the evolution of the current field of IoT, industrial IoT, industry 4.0, it doesn't matter, it applies to, to all those um, topics. So when you go to a trade fair nowadays, right, the industry is somehow stuck on that stuck. They, they started, let's say positive, uh, they started in level one, which is totally fine. And what you see is at the trade fair and at the booth, it all runs under the claim connect and collect, right? So people plug in their machines, plug in their den sensors, build dashboards and look at the data. That's awesome. That's a good start. But as Winfried already mentioned, there is no real business value behind it, right? Looking at the dashboard does not give you any 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 business value. It, it's nice. It's a, you might find some insights where you start to improve, but there is no business value. And because of that, connect and collect, of course, the value of each and every single data point coming from a sensor or a machine is pretty much low. So people don't really see the need for trustworthy data. But if you enter the next level, right, if you start to improve processes, if you start to share data uh, with partners, if you start to interlink factories, if you start to build up maybe tiny little business models, um, the value of each data point, of course, gets more and more, uh, yeah, it gets more valuable. So the need of trustworthy data, of course, gets higher and higher. And we truly believe that level three is, is what already happened in the first phase of digitalization, right? So new ecosystems will happen, uh, new infrastructures will happen, new platforms will pop up, new products will pop up, new business model, service model, all these uh, with interconnected machine to machine uh, economy, all this will happen because it already happened once, right? So it's just the new data source, which is now driving this. Um, and in such a scenario, you know, each value point is, is valuable, each data point is very valuable. So, of course, you need to take care of the trustworthiness because otherwise you can't build any business model based on that or people won't do any business with you if you can't, if they can't trust the data you deliver coming from devices. So, how can we actually close this trust gap and how can we create, uh, create uh, trusted data? And yeah, guess what? I think you already. Uh, uh, guess that that's where uberge comes into play um, so we actually think that we need a paradigm shift or let's call it in, a, in addition about let's not only focus on securing the tunnels because there might also be a situation where securing a tunnel is not necessary uh, but let's also start securing the data and let's do this beyond any end to end infrastructure because that's the most flexible way we can have to future proof the fact that we can do any kind of business with the data we have gathered. It's just a quick overview of, of the Uverge solution where we claim to build a chain of trust from the edge, a uh, very high level. So basically what we have, we have two components. We have what we call the Uverge Nano Client. It's a piece of software, it's an SDK, which is, has been optimized to be running actually on, on tiniest devices. So we have it running on battery powered devices and tested it on ARM Cortex M0 infrastructure. So it's really small and really lightweight. And what it does, it gives the device a cryptographical identity and then starts to cryptographically sign uh, single hash values of measurements the device recorded and uh, packs them into a blockchain style protocol. So blockchain style protocol means we have the single signatures of single measurements and we interlink them with the previous signature from the previous measurement. That's what we call to seal and chain data with a so-called Uberge protocol package. So we actually decouple data from the so-called seal, which does not give any clue about the data because it's based on hashes and on signatures. And we anchor those seals in a two level approach through our trust service in the cloud in a kind of public in, in a public blockchain where we are agnostic uh, to what blockchain we need out of the box uh, we use ethereum here so we have a second layer of trust which is decoupled from the data traveling so we don't our solution does not touch uh, the data transmission so we don't care actually how data is transferred so actually the device could even upload the data with an F, uh, to, an, to an FTP server or whatever, or who receives data could use an FTP server, an email to share data. But whoever, whoever receives the data, that's on the right side. So if you receive the data, we have a simple API integration to verify the authenticity and integrity of the data you have received. And this verification is, is done against our service 
but we are only kind of a middleman, kind of an, a notary service. We will give you all the proofs against the anchor we have written into a public blockchain. So we're just a part of infrastructure deliver, delivering you all the cryptographical proofs to, to show you that your data is of authenticity and of integrity and it got not tampered with. Um, and there we already uh, at, at the promises. So since we apply the blockchain technology on the edge device, you know, any kind of manipulation, deletion and injection will not go undetected. We will notice that because we have the signatures and they are interlinked with each other. Because of the linkage of the packages, we also know about the sequence of data, right? So if you change sequence of data, we will notice this because the chain will be broken. Since we talk about blockchain technology and identities, it's, it's a key infrastructure at the end, uh, distributed. We also know the, uh, about the sensor of the data and we use our blockchain service as a time stamping service um, so basically you can say whenever a data arrives on a public infrastructure, that's, that's, the, that's the date when a data was known to, to the community or to the business case. So you don't have to trust the timestamp running on your uh, battery powered sensor hanging in the tree. And all these promises start actually at the edge, at the sensor before data reaches the cloud and with a software only solution. So we don't try to glue any Raspberry Pis to any sensors which are smaller than the Raspberry Pi. Uh, we don't apply blockchain technology just in the cloud like many, many others do because this doesn't solve any issue. Uh, we close the trust gap because we think this trust gap is essential for to, to be closed, to have all the, all the um, business models done, which will of course take care in the blockchain, in the cloud by sharing data between many, many different parties. Um, but beyond any end-to-end -end infrastructure. So, and actually what this does, I already mentioned this, so our service makes data verifiable against its source, right? And that's beyond system boundaries, beyond end-to-end -end infrastructure. So whoever receives the data, again, he can verify the authenticity and integrity of data. So he does not need to be part of any kind of platform. He does not need to be part of any end-to-end infrastructure, I repeat myself here, I guess. <laughs> um, so uh, the, it's a simple way, he receives the data, he gets an API and he can verify it. And that's exactly what we see where this is most important. So if you are in the connect and collect state, uh, something like this is a, is a security feature, but um, this solution really shines if you have IoT cases where more than one party is involved, right? If you, go, if you want to share data with your customers, if you want to share data with your partners, Insurers are actually someone who are very interested in this solution because they know that they can build up business and policies based upon all that data coming from machines, but they need to trust this data. But no insurance in the world will ever be part of any IoT platform or any, any provider out there. So if they have a simple and based on open source and cryptography way to trust and verify the data, that's, that's where we come in. So let's have a quick look at, at what use cases we see in the industry dot zero sector or in the, in the smart factory sector, since this is all about what we are talking here. So as mentioned, um, it's most important when more than one party is involved. So and I think uh, the pay per use model is something, you know, you have the one leasing the machine, you have the customer giving the machine, maybe also the manufacturer of the machine. So if you get a machine uh, via a pay-per-use model or um, um, service per use, how is it called, uh, pay-per-use, um, you know, I am, when I'm the one giving away the machine, I want to be sure that my customer did not find a way to suppress any packages or do any package duplication or any kind of injection uh, to keep his bill low. And as someone who, who leases the machine, I want to know that it's really my machine I'm, I'm getting built against, right? That it's my 100 holes that I've done with my machine, which I now um, have to pay for. So this is, and, and since the whole industry 4.0 sector is more and more shifting into a pay per use model, it's, it's not that clear yet, but I think it's something that totally will happen because we saw it in so many other industries and there are so many um, prominent examples out there. Um, this is a perfect example for the use of our technology. And the beauty actually is since we, since we as Hubert only work on hashes and signatures, you could build up a pay-per-use infrastructure, which is kind of semi-transparent. So nowadays, any pay-per-use infrastructure would need to be like 100 transparent to send all the data of the usage of the machine to the provider so he can create his bill. Uh, with Hubert, actually, you could build up a system which only 
which only publishes one data set per month to the, to the one who gives away the machine. He can verify it with Hubert. We will prove him that's the correct state of the counter or whatever, and he can create um, the bill uh, for, for the machine for this month. Uh, another thing we see out there is proof of work, proof of service. So let's, uh, if you, for example, in the automotive industry, if you, if you have the end of line check and you want to prove uh, which batch of, um, of airbags was applied where or, or which brake system was installed. So whenever it's about system critical or, or uh, security critical stuff within a production field, something where an authority might want to take a look at afterwards or the insurer actually wants to take a look at afterward. That's a perfect way to actually create an immutable lock directly starting from a sensor and starting starting from a machine, which uh, can be then seen as an as an proof because we shift we shift the trust from you know signing any piece of paper that you really screwed in the screw to to the data level coming directly from the sensors. Predictive maintenance was always also something mentioned, which is a beautiful example because you know predictive maintenance will of course get more and more automated. Nowadays it's connect and collect, looking at the dashboard red light, and then the technician has a look and maybe calls uh, calls uh, calls the service provider. But it will be more and more automated. So whenever there's IoT data taken and maybe put into to an AI or an ML to bring out an, uh, a result which then costs you any kind of money and maintenance will cost you money. You should and you should want to make sure that the data which fed the machine learning, which fed the AI algorithm really was the, the data set you wanted to go in there, right? And it's, it's not a fake one. And that's why we believe that, that a solution like ours is important for any kind of AI, AI or ML based stuff because the machine takes the decision, so you really need to make sure that your data set, which is feeding the algorithm, is trustworthy. And actually, we can do, uh, when it comes to AI, we can do stuff like um, audit trail, actually. So we could like anchor the input and anchor the output of a machine learning. So whenever there's something, we had the example of an autonomous car. So whenever, when, so whenever there's an accident happening and people want to find out what happened, we all know that we can't always know why the machine happened like that but if you can immutably prove the input and the output you at least have uh, yeah you have full transparency over the process um, as much as possible so there are other many many more examples when it comes to business model trustworthy digital twin elimination of checks so instead of re uh, re-measuring stuff when they got delivered for you be before you built them into your product you can trust uh, the measurement which is coming from the manufacturer in china any kind of smart smart assembly smart assembly uh, proof of provenance of course right so since we are so tiny with our protocol we can be in every hand scanner and any id uh, device in, in, in tiny tracking chips, track and tracing when it comes to um, uh, logistics and supply chain. And of course, also smart recall, because if you can really prove with which bread, when you can trust where if you prove which batch was um, hit by a recall and you can only want to reclaim then, uh, yeah, they recall them. There are many, many examples. The main point is it works beyond, it delivers trust beyond system boundaries. Um, and this is a good solution if you have good use cases where more than one party is involved, which will be more and more in the future. That's it for me. One minute left. <laughs> great. Thanks, Dominic. That was a great uh, third presentation. And um, we, yeah, as you say, we have one minute left for questions. And indeed, we have uh, got several questions. So um, the first one is, uh, what are your competitors? Is IOTA not doing the same? And uh, yeah, IOTA is considered as one of the competitor, but they do it differently. Um, actually, we use IOTA as one of the blockchains we anchor in, uh, besides to, to Ethereum. So basically, there are two, two philosophies out there, right? They are the ones who try to push the blockchain to the edge, which we think is not the best idea, because blockchain technology will always be energy consuming, so you, it will be heat consuming. Uh, it, it takes a lot of resources and we tr we think and that's our solution to do to close this trust gap to the cloud to the bigger blockchain in a most lightweight and blockchain similar solution so we don't really push the blockchain client or the node to the edge we apply blockchain style technology with the protocol we have delivered which is basically creating like a block of size one 
which then gets transferred into the cloud, um, aggregated into our backend, and then we only anchor a root hash uh, into a public blockchain. Um, th this makes us possible to even run, as mentioned, battery powered devices, tiny sensors. We even have a client running on a SIM card uh, for the connected uh, IoT devices, which IOTA is not capable of. So uh, their client, uh, still the smallest one, is way bigger than ours. Great. All right. Uh, that was a quite detailed answer. Perfect. Um, so maybe one question that um, doesn't require that much detail. How many customers do you have already? As you've seen in the chart, uh, it, it's quite early. So we have an, we're doing a lot of POCs with a lot of big brands. Uh, we're currently gathering a lot of um, customers in the healthcare sector because our technology is all also used uh, in, in, in the certification of Corona test uh, result. Uh, the industry 4.0 sector in Germany is not, uh, not going as good as we thought, but we are strong in the energy sector, healthcare sector, uh, but I can't name a number for customer yet, but there are real applications out there. Yeah, it's, the product is ready and you can buy it off the shelf. Yeah. Okay, cool. So one more question. Uh, how is support organized? How get admins access to edge devices? Uh, actually, we don't, they don't need access to, so this is not our part actually. So the, the SDK, which we deliver the client, has to be has to be put on the sensor itself, and it's just a part of the sensor firmware. So it, it, it's not the whole firmware. So it's not really part of what we cover. Um, that's, that that does, does not fire. Uh, yeah, not fall into our field. Not on, yeah. Not all on right. Then one last question uh, for you. And uh, yeah, but yeah, but Dominic, Dominic, yeah. my understanding yeah. is this edge device management is probably what Red Hat or or we are doing or offering. So it's it's more likely it's a combination of a, in a solution. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's something that you need, but it's not related to our. Yeah, but but it could be something we put together, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So there we see uh, it's always something of an ecosystem approach. So you always will need more than one partner to to solve such such issues. And uh, yeah, so one last question. Uh, what if breach data enter your solution? You wrote this corrupted data to the blockchain. How your solution protect this? Uh, that's true. So like, uh, like blockchain and AI, they all have the shit in shit out problem. Sorry for the harsh word, but that's, uh, that's, that's it. Uh, but, but that's exactly why we are there, right? Because if you apply blockchain to IoT data on cloud level, your this problem is even worse right because you don't you, you you don't have any proof of provenance where data is coming from so um since we apply the client on the sensor itself we can at, we, we can we can make this uh th this transportation layer or, or this, this this stream um uh, trustworthy right but of course you can use our service to write whatever you want to in a public blockchain that's true but the question is, who wants to verify it, right? So you st always need a verifier on the other hand. Perfect. All right, that's a great conclusion. Um, thank you, everyone. And a special thanks to all the speakers, uh, Wolfram, Winfried, Dominic, and uh, also to Jan, so to Disrupt Network. Big thanks. Um, thank you for, for listening. And um, as I said, we will send around um, a follow-up email in the upcoming days uh, so you can get access to the recording as well as to the um, shown slides. Thanks everyone. See you.